Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. When your current systems no longer help you do your job, it's time for a revolution. I'm Teresa Resick, the Vice President of Market Intelligence at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And joining us today are Alan Pell Sharp of Deep Analysis, and from AO Docs, we have David Jones and Rich Lowers. AO Docs is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them very much for their support. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Before we get started, just want to share a few tips for you for, so that you can participate in today's webinar. And we are very thrilled that you are here today. And so by joining live, you can resize the windows that are in front of you. And you, I encourage you to open up group chat. Um, and that's so that you can message with each other and also with us um, here at AIM. And also, uh, when you open up group chat, and it's in the the list of icons across the bottom of your page. Um, just say hello and share where you're joining us from. I encourage you to download the resources that we have available uh, for you, and that's to the right of the slide area. And um, please ask your questions of the speakers um, using the Q&A feature and ask them as you think of them, because uh, with this webinar, we're going to be taking your questions as we go along today. Um, in addition, we'll still have a little bit of time at the very end to answer any other questions that you'll have. And at the end of, this, of the webinar, I uh, would greatly appreciate it if you would take, a, take the survey. I truly value your feedback and, and for you to let us know how we did today. And the link to the survey is also in those uh, icons across the bottom. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's resources webinars page in just a few days. Now to introduce our trio of speakers that we have with us today. Um, David Jones is the VP of Marketing at AO Docs, and he's responsible for developing the global go-to-market strategy and execution plans. He has over 20 years' experience in the emerging technology space across multiple industries, including big data, analytics, cloud, and enterprise content management. And prior to joining AO Docs, Dave was Vice President of AIMS European Operations and it was the CEO and founder of a document management startup for eight years and held product and marketing management roles with Nexio, Konica Minolta, and Highland. Dave is an AIMS certified information professional and holds a place on the AIMS board of directors. Alan Pell Sharp is the founder and CEO of Deep Analysis, and Alan has over 25 years of experience in the IT industry working with a wide variety of end user organizations like FedEx, the Mayo Clinic, and Allstate, and also with vendors ranging from Oracle to IBM to startups around the world. His research and advisory work focuses on the enterprise use of blockchain and artificial intelligence, and he is the author of Practical Artificial Intelligence and Enterprise Playbook. He's regularly quoted in the press, including TechCrunch, TechTarget, Computer Weekly, and has appeared on the BBC, CNBC, and ABC as an expert guest. And last but not least, we also have Rich Lowers, who is an information governance professional assisting clients in developing strategic solutions for tackling the toughest information management and governance challenges. He's been in the information technology and information management industry for over 20 years, serving in-house and consultative roles for Fortune 500 and AMLA 100 firms. Rich is a member of AIM and has also has earn, earned his Certified Information Professional designation. And he speaks regularly on a variety of topics in information management at the local and national level. So with that illustrious introduction of our panel of speakers, I'm going to turn things over to Dave Jones to take things from here. Dave? Teresa, thank you, and hello to everybody who's on the call today. Um, it's my pleasure to set the stage today, really, for our illustrious, uh, illustrious speakers who are going to be coming on in a few minutes to talk about legacy systems and really to discuss their views on why now is a good time to consider revamping those systems that you've got and looking at uh, some of the more modern alternatives, if you like. But to set that scene, I want to go off topic a little bit to start with. I want to talk about personal technology. Take a look at the screen. Um, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment are some of the latest and greatest personal devices, circa 2002. 
So around about 18 years ago, if my maths is correct. So we've got an early iPod. We've got a BlackBerry. Remember those? Uh, and we've got a, a brick of a Nokia phone. Those items were the top tech gadgets of the time. Now let's fast forward to 2020. Uh, it's a little bit of a different scene. Uh, we've got self-driving cars. We've got wearable devices that monitor pretty much everything. They monitor our heart rate, our daily steps, even our sleep patterns. And of course, we've got numerous home automation devices that help us do massively challenging things like turning the lights on and off. Um, I have no idea how we coped before those, to be quite frank. Um, but seriously, what, what is my point here? Well, the main point here is that time waits for no one. Technology has been progressing at such a breakneck speed for years now. Um, and it shows no signs of slowing down. But the interesting thing there is that we've welcomed technology into our personal lives pretty much universally. Have we done that because the vendors have been forcing us to take this new technology? Well, I don't think we have. I don't think that's the case. I think that these consumer technologies have been so universally welcomed by us because they're actually easy to adopt. They're easy to use. The migration between an old phone and a new one isn't painful most times. The difference between an old TV and a new TV isn't difficult to get. The barriers to moving are not significant. Or at least the consumer tech companies have done a really good job at removing those barriers to change wherever possible. And that's where I want to draw a parallel to business technology. Because business technology, quite frankly, has been moving just as fast as consumer technology. We've got AI-enabled everything coming out from all the vendors at the moment. But I have a question for you. How many of you, how many of you on the line today have moved as easily from old business tech to new business tech as you have done in your personal lives? Or to put that question a little bit more bluntly, um, which year is your corporate technology stack most closely aligned to? 2020 or still 2002? And for many of you, I would argue um, that it's actually closer to 2002 than 2020. And hopefully that's why you're here today, to learn from people who are way smarter than me about how you can change this legacy technology stack burden that you find yourselves with. And one of those smart people today is Alan Pell Sharp of Deep Analysis. So, Alan, can you help us out here? Well, I can give it a go, Dave. Um, I don't know how smart I am, but I've been around the block a few times. So, uh, looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you, some experiences with you. And um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see where this goes. But uh, as Dave said, we're, we're in a sort of odd situation. We're not going to talk about that specific situation on this call. We're all aware of what it is, but it's certainly sharpening our minds and the thoughts about, um, you know, wh where we go in the future and the uh, fragility, if you like, of many of the IT and uh, information and data architectures around us. So very, very quickly, I, I won't spend much time on this, but yeah, I'm an industry analyst. I run deep analysis. Our focus has always been, and my focus has always been, um, on trying to bridge that gap between these wonderful new technologies, which Dave alluded to, and the practical real world. Um, you know, I have tried to keep a foot in that practical real world over many years, and, and I'm fully aware that it's, it's very easy for somebody to come along and say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Why, you know, why aren't you digitally transforming? Why aren't you using AI? Well, the, the reality is you've, you've got a lot of stuff. Uh, you've got a lot of legacy. You've got a lot of history to deal with. And, and it's just not that straightforward. That being said, I think it's actually a bit more straightforward than we give it credit for. I think we overcomplicate things sometimes. So, you know, we live in a world where everyone says they're digitally transforming their organizations. I can tell you as an industry analyst, not so. Um, Yes, 
things are changing. Um, and many feel that they're way behind the curve. And some are. That's, that's the reality. But I think we're all in a similar position. Um, maybe it's just semantics, but I think when we see that word transform, it sounds like we're ripping and replacing everything. We're breaking through the doorways into some bright new future. And, and, and it's just not quite as simple as that. Um, you know, really, one has to take practical first steps. And you have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. You have to do all of these things, which are all perfectly logical. But in my experience, many companies don't really do it. Um, what does happen is that um, many of those who are the first out of the door, so we've been talking about digital transformation for, what, a decade now, essentially, um, certainly in earnest the last five or six years. But what we found out is that many people who are first out the door trying to sort of upend the world and uh, reinvent everything, um, they made a bit of a mess of it, frankly. They spent a lot of money and they didn't achieve very much. Well, that's tough on them, but you know, there's lessons to be learned there. And I think there's a lot of lessons that we have learned uh, and that we can share going forward. Um, and, and hopefully that's what we're going to do a little of here. We can't, um, can't boil the ocean, can't fix everything, but we can certainly look at the tricky, knotty situation of, uh, you know, we call them legacy. That's, that's what people like to call it in the industry, but, you know, old systems, uh, old systems that have been hanging around that nobody's got the nerve to deal with. So I think we can certainly do something with uh, that, demystify it a little bit, and uh, and show you some practical steps as how to move forward. And, and it really does come down to where to start. And it seems so obvious, but honestly, I honestly cannot think of a project over the last 10, 15 years that I've watched that has gone wrong. Uh, and I've watched lots of them. It's sort of my job. Um, I also look at the ones that go well, of course. But um, the ones that go wrong teaches the most lessons uh, most often. And it's that tussle between business as usual and transformation. Um, nobody's really suggesting that you switch off the lights, go away, come back another day and start all over again. That's, that's not how this goes. Um, but you do have to have continuity in your business. And I think this is an important thing to take into account, you know, before we get into some actual concrete next steps, um, right up front. Any sort of transformation, any new technologies that come in have to deal with business today, the history and legacy of your company, and put in place a building block for you to step onto, to build further upon. Anything that really comes in that is absolutely going to transform you overnight is, well, it's almost certainly a myth. It's not going to happen. So it's about taking simple, solid next steps each time. And here's the thing, if you do take your transformation slowly, steadily, but nevertheless radically, um, I think, you know, this is, you know, five bullet points here. For different people, these will be in a different order. It diff depends on your organization, what you prioritize. And it's not a complete list either. But I think I've put number one at the top here, ability to change and adapt. And it goes back to what Dave was saying, is that most organizations aren't really geared up to change and adapt to changing circumstances, whether that be new suppliers, new citizen um, demands, um, unrealistic demands from customers, or, or simply adopting new te technologies. They're just not in a position to do that. The second one's an odd one uh, for some people, but when I explain it, sometimes the light goes on and people say, ah, oh, that's actually our problem. And it's the need to find things. And in this current situation, I don't know how many calls I've had over the last few day days, um, but this is actually becoming all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, a problem. Um, as people are home working, they can't access things which they could access at work. Um, now, there's many reasons for that. There's not one. But ultimately, we live in an information world where certainly within the enterprise, we contrast dramatically with our sort of lives as consumers, as citizens, where it's actually very easy to find things in the citizen world. We just open our iPhone and, uh, and type in something in Google and we find it. 
we have exactly the opposite experience in most enterprises. We really struggle to find things, whether that's somebody in a call center who has somebody telling us that I wrote to you last week or whether it's an invoice or, or a contract or whatever. Just finding things is incredibly difficult. And, and it's time for that to change. That's just not it's not acceptable and it's not it's not necessary anymore. We can fix that. Uh, again, I won't necessarily go through all of these. I think you'll figure out that uh, reduced costs and reduced uh, complexities are pretty sort of straightforward business benefits. But AI machine learning, let me do touch on that one because it's broader than just sort of some aspiration. A lot of companies do want to use AI machine learning. Um, and I think there's a shift going on there. It's, it's an important one to, to recognize. A few years ago, AI machine learning was about reinventing the world. It was about doing amazing things with big data. Um, and that still goes on, but the reality in most organizations, and I suspect will increase dramatically over the coming months, is actually the use of things like machine learning and even RPA and any kind of automation, really, where we start tackling the smaller tasks, the smaller problems, the things where people are doing manual key entry um, when it's just not really necessary anymore. That kind of work can be automated. And it's going to be a shift of focus there. And those tools, again, um, do exist. There are lots of different types of automation and analysis tools out there. But you know what? Unless they've got good data, unless they've got clean data, they don't actually need lots of data. That's a myth. Um, they do need good and clean data. And if they don't have that, then they can't work. So there's an absolute need to start looking at any organization that has hundreds, in some cases, thousands of SharePoint installations. They have old document management system situations um, to deal with. They've got uh, file servers from God knows when full of uh, folders within locked folders within locked folders that belong to people who don't work for the company anymore. These are the kind of problems we've been able to sweep under the carpet for quite some time, um, for years, really, say, oh, well, you know, I'll get around to it one day, sooner or later. It's not a priority. I think it is a priority. And I think certainly the people I'm talking to are starting to realize that, you know, it's, it's time to do something. The issue is they don't really know what to do. Um, they do have conversations that say, well, why don't you leave everything there and we can connect to it and we can do, as the um, slide here suggests, uh, we can federate. Um, you know, somehow or other we can um, magically touch all of these points and pull them together into one and everybody will be able to uh, work, access everything, find everything. It's a great idea, but I can tell you from hard experience, it's unusual for that one to work out. Um, there are layers of complexity to making a federated situation work. And I'll just go as far as to say, nine times out of 10, I would say just simply walk away from those kind of situations. Um, anybody who wants to contact me after this, you, you'll have my email address. I'm not gonna charge you anything. I'm happy to share stories with you and some advice. Um, but the bottom line is that there is a long history of that not working. You've got two options, really, I would say. You've got an option to migrate, to actually tackle the problem and say, OK, you know what, it's time to do something. I need to move this stuff and I need to move it to somewhere which is much more agile, potentially cheaper, easier to use, easier to access, uh, easier to do stuff with, um, be that uh, automation or just analysis. Or in some cases, and this is important to note here, in some cases, leave it alone. Um, I would say this is definitely not the majority of cases. This is a minority. But there are situations where I have told people just, you know what? I hate to say this. Don't tell anybody else, but leave that for somebody else another day. There are situations out there where you bought something 20 years ago, uh, your developers have worked on it. You've integrated with it. It's got multiple dependencies. It's spaghetti code. Yes, it's a big problem, but that's probably not the place to start um, because that really is high risk. That really is high cost, and that really is highly complex. That, though, is not the case most of the time. 
And, and that's really, um, as we go forward here, the, the thing I want to stress with you, migrating an old legacy system to a new environment, honestly, if you follow the steps, if you follow the best practices, it's really not that difficult. It's not that complex and it's not that costly. And it can be done in a relatively short period of time. Again, following best practices and frankly, learning from those who tried to do it the wrong way in the past. So I said, it's all about where do you start? Where are your first steps? What to, um, you know, how do you put your foot forward in a, in a good positive way? Well, this is all common sense. Now, a phrase I personally use way too often uh, but I don't apologize for it. Common sense actually isn't that common. Um, so, you know, do take this as concrete advice to start here. Undertake a review of who actually uses these old systems, right? You'd be surprised how many people don't actually do that, okay? Do a review of who actually uses these systems, why they use it, and of course, what's actually in there. I can tell you now, from experience and from many consultants I've talked to over the years, that's always an interesting exercise. You will learn things you did not know and, um, and things you possibly didn't want to know, but you will have uh, uh, an interesting experience there. Then decide what you want to migrate. Now, again, let's take a pause here. Don't migrate everything that's in your old system. There's no point. Most of it's junk. Um, you will be the one exception to the rule. If your old system, be that an old Kodak system or a Documentum system or a SharePoint or a file server or whatever, if the reality is that 80% uh, plus of what's in there is redundant, it's a duplicate, it's old, nobody uses it, nobody's accessed in it years, nobody actually needs it anymore. Don't do the mistake, don't do the huge mistake of lifting everything and shifting it to a new environment because you've just shifted the problem to a new environment. Take this as an opportunity to decide what you want to migrate. Now, that doesn't mean hitting a big delete button. It doesn't mean just wiping the earth. It does mean, though, potentially, yes, deleting some of it. And in some cases, just say, yeah, I'm not sure about this. So you just lift and shift to something dirt cheap and forget about it. And if one day for a governance reason, for a compliance reason, you need to know where it is, you know where it is. So again, only migrate what you need to migrate. And then prioritize. You're likely to have, maybe some of you on this call only have one old system. Again, that's unusual. Even in small organizations, that's unusual. There's usually multiple. Figure out which one is the most valuable, the most critical to the business, um, you know, how much active activity is there on there, how much is there, and you can see where I'm going with this. Bite off something simple first, right? Don't go in and uh, just say, oh, well, let's take the biggest, most critical um, system we've got and we'll start there. No, because every time you do this, you're going to learn something. And once you've been through this migration process, once you pretty much know what you're doing and maybe you'll learn a little bit more each time but again as i say it's pretty standard but do it the first time with something that is relatively low priority and isn't actively used that much right that's just again a bit of common sense so um what we've done for you is we have built a little methodology of sorts uh, which we call the 60 20 20 methodology which is pretty literal because it says 60% of your time should be in preparation. So when I told you where to start on the previous slide, that's what I was talking about. Take your time to find out what this system actually does as opposed to what you assume it does, who actually uses it, what's in there, why it's used, how often it's used, et cetera, et cetera. If it's got dependencies, et cetera, just, just do that. Now, that's not a three-month consulting job. That is something that can be done in a day, a week. It's a relatively short period of time. But do prepare properly. And we've got steps on here. I won't go through them here. You, I believe there's, uh, you're going to have a, access to a copy of an e-book and, and a much more detailed 
step by death step uh, infographic which will lead you through the migration process but suffice to say for now the bulk of the work is in preparing and figuring out what you've got where it needs to go what doesn't need to go etc etc the migrate thing you will and i would highly recommend you do use um, a migration tool or service of some description don't just take this on yourself um, there's plenty out there there's plenty of people who know what they're doing this bit is fairly mechanical if you did your preparation properly. Um, so that part of the process is, is relatively straightforward. And then once it's in the new system, again, don't just say, oh, I moved it. Um, you know, that's your opportunity to optimize and to actually transform. That's your opportunity to do something new. And again, I know this seems like sort of pretty straightforward advice, and it is. But I have seen many migrations where it's moved and ah, everybody's gone on to the next thing. OK, well, you close down an old system. Good for you. That's a checkbox uh, checked. But you've missed an opportunity. These uh, migration projects are real opportunities to start that transformation process in a digestible, uh, relatively low risk, uh, low cost and fairly quick way. So this is really your starting point for transformation, assuming you have legacy systems. Um, there's no point just building something out anew. Uh, you really need to do deal with the past, your business continuity, and slowly, step by step, move that into a new and safe environment. And I think, Dave, that's my 20 minutes, if my watch is correct, and I don't want to run over. So I know we've got questions, and I know you've got more to say. So I'm going to pass it back to you. Alan, thank you very much. Um, valuable insight, as ever, from yourself. Um, you're absolutely right. We do have lots of questions coming in from the people on the webinar today. And again, just to remind everybody that's on the call, um, there is a Q&A section if you have questions that you'd like to ask of Alan uh, or of Rich Lowers, um, who I'm going to introduce now in a second and bring into the conversation. Please do fill out that Q&A. Uh, we've got a lot in there already, but we'll do our best to get through as many of those questions as we can in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. And Rich, let's get you involved straight away here. So we've talked a lot today about doing digital transformation and about migrating away from legacy systems. But are there specific systems or even specific industries that transform more easily than others or, or even less easily than others? Well, I would say less easily is probably the easier list to, to kind of recite. It's really those organizations who have a legacy not only of uh, generating a great deal of content, but those organizations that have a legacy and a future that shows uh, a highly regulated uh, landscape for that content, right? And you know, there are some participants here that are in the power industry or that are in the biopharmaceutical industry. Those challenges are, are really kind of top of mind when, when you ask me who, who has a harder job, but they're not insurmountable, right? Being able to clearly identify what you have and where you have it to follow some of Alan's guidelines are things that hopefully you already have a great deal of maturity on and you can easily then identify the nature of some of that content and what is a good candidate for migrating, not only because of your, your legal or regulatory archival needs, but because that there may be a means for adding more value to it. You know, to reiterate Alan's point, if you're going to bother to move the data, add some value to it. You know, don't just do the dump and run and, and move the data to another problem, another location, but truly, you know, do something with that data to be able to add value to the organization or position the data so that it can be more easily uh, used by the organization, whether that be for legal or regulatory issues or whether that be for um, new discovery, right? Especially in those industries, that certainly is one of the, one of the profiles. All right, Alan, and, and same question, but with a slightly different flavor to yourself. Are, are there any industries that um, have tried this and have failed? We, you talked right at the start of, of your intro um, about the fact that, that some of the people that are trying this are failing and, and aren't getting it right and aren't being the trailblazers maybe that they thought they would be. Uh, any specific industries or, or departmental solutions that are having problems with that? 
Yes and no. I mean, in the sense that it, I don't know if it's industry specific. Um, I, I will say, it, I mean, again, this is in my experience. I want to qualify that. It's not like I've got charts and data to back this up. But in my experience, oil and gas uh, was one that was a very early adopter of document management and were incredibly enthusiastic adopters of SharePoint. And, um, you know, I certainly know of instances there where one day they sat down and says, whoa, this has really gotten out of control um, and uh, really didn't go about it the right way and had to stop pretty quickly because, frankly, they were making a bad situation worse. I think where it's interesting, though, where, where there are industries which are, are, are better suited, oddly enough, are those who, and this is going to sound crazy, but those who haven't really done anything. You said, I think, was it, is your IT nearer to 2002, Dave? Um, those people who really do have, you know, aging systems, they're in a much better position to do this because in most cases they bought very complex uh, ECM systems, um, they have masses of file servers full of files. Um, and actually, it's relatively straightforward to go through that and realize, A, with my ECM system, I actually wasn't using a fraction of the functionality. And B, there's an awful lot of stuff here that nobody's touched in years. Um, so in a, in a way, the older the systems, the easier they are to migrate. Interesting. Uh, and that actually ties in really nicely to a number of the questions that we've got coming in. Um, comments around, um, well, hey, look, a lot of those legacy systems are just archives. Um, why do we need to, to update them at all? Why don't we just leave the data there until it's eligible for disposal? And, and in tandem with that, how should we approach these systems and data that are regulated by agencies that demand some form of long-term preservation. Alan, let's throw that one to you to start with, and then we'll come to Rich afterwards. Yeah, well, this is obviously uh, Rich's passion, so I'll um, I'll say some things, and then maybe he'll uh, agree or he'll contradict me. But I think the bottom line is one: um, most people who say that don't actually have. Um, a real policy in place um, that is regulatory compliant. There's just an assumption that we can't get rid of things. Um, I've come across that many times where people have simply assumed they're not allowed to get rid of things. Whereas in fact, legally, they should have been getting rid of things. It's the exact opposite. I think the other thing to note is that most of these older systems that we're talking about where there's actually valuable current uh, information or valuable information that could be leveraged in the future, they're not archiving systems. They were never built to be archiving systems. So if you really need an archive, um, you know, then go out and get yourself an archive system or move it to tape. You don't have to destroy it, but it certainly doesn't need to be sitting and costing you money and slowing you down. Um, so there's different ways of dealing with it. I mean, that's very high level. Rich, uh, I'll pass to you because uh, I, I may get out of my depth there and uh, you're going to tell me I'm wrong. Rich, oh, Rich dive in. The floor is yours. yours. Well, I can carry on. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've lost Rich for a few seconds. I'm sure he'll come back. I'm sure um, he'll come and, back. But seriously, with the that's such a common question, and and I understand it, and and I and I feel for people who have that situation where people say, no, 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 you can't touch this. It's got to be left alone. I, I got to tell you, that is hardly ever the reality. Um, and particularly now, we're getting into an era of um, it's not just about long-term preservation; it's about privacy. Right. So you take things like GDPR. I mean, you could be sitting on a GDPR nightmare. Um, so I, I agree they're difficult. You have to deal with each one individually. But um, again, most of these systems, uh, file, file servers were not designed to be archive systems. ECM systems were not designed to be archive systems. If you have a need for an archive system, uh, you can just move it to cheap tape. You can move it somewhere else. Um, but it that's not where it should be sitting. So I think that's the pushback immediately to people who say that. Well, if that's your need, this isn't where your stuff should be. All right, good stuff, Alan. Thank you for that. I know Rich has just joined back on, but I'm going to give him a slightly more provocative 
uh, question to answer. Um, something that's come in from the audience, I, I love this question. Someone's asking, uh, Rich, any suggestions on dealing with um, people within the organization who insist on retaining their own application and data, even when it's duplicating similar systems elsewhere? How do we deal with people like that, Rich? <laughs> Well, convenience nice. copies, yeah, convenience copies are certainly a, a bit problematic. Well, so I, I guess uh, uh, one one example I can give would be um, being able to tell those uh, those coworkers or or those data owners that you are happy for them to keep a copy of them and then give them the liability waiver document to sign saying that they t- take full responsibility and absolve the company in any liability for retaining that content. And you'll find very quickly that that uh, share, they'll suddenly share the value of the risk of that profile as opposed to the value that it may have. And quite frankly, you know, if a PowerPoint from 10 years ago has value still, there, there's a different problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and Dave, could I just add something to Rich's comments? There was one instance I was involved in where I, I agree totally with what, what Rich said. There was one instance I was involved with a uh, big company in the Midwest uh, where they had that, where they had a department saying, no, 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 you're not touching our stuff. Um, and IT dealt with it by saying, OK, well, you can pay from it from now on. It's not coming out of our budget. Surprising how quick they changed their uh, tune on that one. That's great advice, yeah. So basically let them pay for it out of their own budgets. That, yep. that will, um, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, change some people's opinions. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, Rich, let's come back to you on this one. Uh, even with the methodology that I once described, um, these migration projects are quite big projects. Uh, massive would, was is a term that someone's used uh, through the Q&A. Um, how do we deal with that? Do we deal with them as massive projects? Do we try and break them down into smaller projects? Uh, and have we got any examples that we can share there? Well, certainly, you know, one of the one of the best examples is you know being able to use some of the some of the machine learning or or artificial intelligence capabilities that are out there to really pick the data that either has value or an obligation associated to it, and not try to move everything right. Out of, you know, if somebody says, I have seven terabytes of data I need to move, I would ask very, very pointedly, do you have seven terabytes worth of value? Is there truly information in there that, that is all weighted the same? Or, you know, can you use some of your uh, some of your information governance or records management professionals in your company to start to, to wait to, or prioritize that data based on the immediate access needs, right, for, for critical business data? for vital records, to, to use a, a, an older term, or to identify not only the things that you're legally obliged to keep, but that are most frequently used, or in fact that are, you know, are retrieved or used you know, to respond to regulatory inquiries or even internal business inquiries. Right? Use some sort of criteria to, to eat that elephant, right? And in fact, you may find very quickly that uh, as you start to migrate that the content remaining becomes less and less valuable and in fact in some cases can just age out in place to to Alan's point earlier and and die with the decommissioning of that service as opposed to be migrated to just be deleted in the future okay thanks rich you you mentioned uh the ai buzzword in there it, it's compulsory in every single webinar i think at the moment so <laughs> so let's hit that one head on um I, but alan i want to give that a slightly different slant for you um a lot of people when they they think about ai and machine learning still have a an anxiety if you like around um using that um can you talk a little bit about whether that's justified uh, and whether using AI and ML from a migration project's perspective is is something that, that adds enough value to, to justify the risk? Well, no, it's really, that's, this, that's such a, a complex and layered question, Dave. I'll, I'll tackle it as best I can. Um, first of all, most AI is actually pretty straightforward and boxed for you. Um, so, you know, if you think you're going to suddenly have to start hiring half of MIT to come in and, you know, 
trawling through petabytes of big data. That, that's just not how it works in the real world uh, for most of us. Um, you're talking about prepackaged apps. Um, you, know, you know, you don't have to write an algorithm. You, you know, it, it's it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, obviously, everybody should read Practical Artificial Intelligence, um, an enterprise playbook available on Amazon by yours truly, which demystifies the topic. But the whole goal of that book is to demystify. I mean, honestly, it, it's not as complex as you think. The underlying um, engine, if you like, that runs a machine learning or, or a, a, an AI or a deep learning um, model. Uh, yeah, that's complex stuff, but, you know, so is the inside of my car. I don't need to know how it exactly works. Um, so, you know, yeah, when it comes to migration, um, in very large migrations, um, it, it definitely does justify it. A lot of the time, I'll be frank with you, just some basic analytics. I mean, as simple as how long ago was this, this file last accessed? You'd be surprised. Stuff comes up. Actually, nobody ever accessed this file. Somebody stuck it there and it was never accessed again. Um, you know, those kind of very simple metrics can be sufficient. But just to pick up on, on a point which comes into AI and big migrations, what's big to one person isn't to another. Um, I've heard people say uh, over the last few years, oh, yeah, but, you know, we've got like 50 million files in this system. Actually, by today's standards, that ain't that big. Um, that's a pretty straightforward migration. Um, there are others who are talking multiple billions of files. Okay, that's a big project. So again, if you think your project is massive, you might want to ask around because you might find it's a lot more doable than you think. And if it is a massive project, then yes, that's where complex analytics and machine learning can, can really earn their, their money. All right, good stuff. It sounds like my question was more complex than, than the overall situation. So uh, glad of that. Let me give Rich an easy question in that case. Um, Rich Allen's talked about 60-20-20 as the best practice or preferred way to look at these migration projects. Is that what people are currently doing or, or are they working to their own sort of ratios? I think it's more 20-60-20. That that unfortunately, especially when when there are burning platforms or there are maintenance invoices suddenly appearing that 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 spur change, that the the incentive to try to act and decide before preparing is more common than than it really should be, and that you know in this in this day and age especially the idea to focus on preparation and and knowing knowing your organization and knowing your data before you begin to try to approach a, a way to digest it or make it more accessible or in fact maybe find it you know opportunities to decommission some of it that that is the best case but it, it's certainly it's not it's not what happens most often and you know that's one of the things that, that we really try to do with clients is really help them understand how that preparation not only can can really benefit them but to Alan's point it, it, it's not six months worth of work it can truly be and happen fairly quickly, especially if you leverage the, you know, the professionals already in your organization who know the data. And we may not necessarily be the owners, but they're certainly good custodians of it for you, whether that be in IT or your information governance teams. Okay, thanks, Rich. Um, I've got another one for you before we come back to Alan for the final question. Um, we've got someone asking questions about a halfway house. They want to supercharge their legacy application by um, putting it into a container and, and migrating that to the cloud to get uh, better, better experience, better um, performance. Is that something that you'd advise, Rich? Well, you know, so doing old things in new places doesn't necessarily add value. Um, and, in, you know, while that technology is a great way to migrate legacy systems, the problem of the data still remains, even though you may have relieved the cost of the physical infrastructure or you may have relieved some of the accessibility problems. Um, I, I would contend that you know the ability to uh, provide data with a better service profile, whether that be for you know cloud native apps like AODocs, or whether that be a better service profile in, in that there is more data or more context to the information to help the business. I think is usually a better approach. 
Uh, not that those technologies aren't helpful. Um, I don't know if they're, they're problem solvers as much as they are foundational for assisting IT organizations, not necessarily the business directly. All right, thank you, Rich. And, and Alan, final question for you from me. Let's bring things back to, to today and to the current situation that many of us find ourselves in, uh, having to work from home, having to work uh, in, in isolation in an environment that is very different to what some of us have been used to, right? Are we seeing good examples or examples of good usage of digital technology uh, to allow people to work effectively from home? I've spoken to so many journalists about this very topic this week, so I should know the answer, <laughs> but I think the truth is there isn't an answer. Uh, certainly, uh, look, there's no two ways about it. Um, you know, collaboration and remote working technologies are, are exploding, and they have done over the last 10 days. Um, you know, you, you can just Google what's going on with uh, Microsoft Teams and Google and Cisco. I mean, it's crazy, right? And Avaya. Um, but I think best practices, um, you know, the odd thing is, is the tech industry is, has, has long sort of, well, not everybody, but a lot of people in the tech industry have long embraced home working. So they're, they're pretty, pretty well set up for it. Um, it's a much harder shift for a lot of people. And I think um, one example I've seen this week, uh, actually last week, um, has to do with call centers, where it's now pretty clear that a lot of that work could have been done remotely, but it was never structured to be. Um, they've structured their IT, they've structured their business processes that everybody sat in a cubicle next to each other. Um, and that is a really, really tough shift for them. And it's partly a sort of networking, VPN, security, privacy. It's partly those problems. But you know what a lot of it is, is access to legacy systems. People in call centers typically access multiple systems on their screens, and they can't do that from home. So um, I think we're all going through a learning phase. Um, you know, making lemon out of lemonade, lemonade out of lemons here, but uh, might be doing it the other way around. Not sure. Um, we'll see how this pans out. We're all going to learn a lot, um, and um, but I think one of the things we're already learning, and it, it's just coincidental that it ties in with this uh, webinar, is that uh, simply accessing a source of information ain't so easy when you're working from home. Um, and th those are going to become priorities to address as uh, this moves forward and we come out the other side. Absolutely. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both very much for your insight. And Alan, that beautifully doves, dovetails into um, the piece of content that we've been basing a lot of the, the conversation on today. Alan has written a guide to digital migration, uh, which will be arriving in the inbox of everybody that's registered for the webinar today, so do look out for that. Uh, it's fantastic reading, and I would thoroughly recommend you taking the time to go through that. Uh, if there's anything that you'd like to know about AODOCS, um, please feel free to visit our website. And with that, I will pass back to Teresa uh, to close things out. Thanks, Dave. And I just wanted to briefly mention here one more resource resource for you um, is AIM Training. And now's the time to take advantage of the online learning opportunities that we have. Um, AIM offers self-paced classes on a variety of topics, and we can even arrange for a virtual instructor-led classroom customized to your organization's needs. So check out AIM.org slash training. That's going to give you a bunch of information about the kinds of classes we have there. And just click on the Contact Us link that you're going to find on any of those pages. And the folks here at AIM can answer your questions and be able to point you to a way that you can take advantage of AIM training right now in your organization, all led virtually with a live instructor. Um, so a lot of different things that AIM can do to help you with this. And um, we're getting at the end of our webinar time, and I just uh, wanted just to remind everybody that we have recorded the webinar, so you can come back and catch it again, invite your colleagues to listen to it. Please download the resources. Um, 
Dave and his team and Alan have shared some really cool links in there. So I want you to take advantage of that. Please take the feedback survey. Um, very much want to thank our underwriter, AO Docs. Uh, without the support from our solution providers, AIM would not be able to bring you these free educational programs like our webinar series. Uh, and as we bring this webinar to a close, I want to leave everyone with the closing thoughts of our speakers today. And I'm going to start first with Alan Pell Sharp. Your closing thoughts. Uh, my closing thoughts really are that um, this is a topic we've talked about for probably 20 years plus. Um, the time is now, I mean, you, you know, to, to give access to people wherever they need it at any time. Um, to actually position yourself to be agile in the future, because who knows what the future looks like. Um, this is a great starting point. It's not as scary as you think, and um, really seriously advise you to start having a look at those creaky old systems and consider migrating them. Thanks, Alan. And Rich Lowers, your closing thoughts today. Well, I guess the most important thing I would ask everybody to carry away is to, to start. The, uh, the ability to make a decision and start doing these investigative approaches for your information, I think, is the best way to not only make a more informed decision, but be prepared when that decision may be forced upon you in these crazy days. Thanks. And Dave Jones, your key takeaways or closing thoughts. Absolutely, and I think it builds on top of what both Alan and Rich have just said. You know, Alan's right. We've been talking about this for years, about the need to migrate legacy systems. Uh, and to Rich's point, you know, people need to start. But what we've been missing, I think, is a practical set of guidelines or tips and tricks about how to do this, how to break down the projects. Uh, that's exactly what we've worked with Alan to create uh, in the ebook and then the associated infographics. So I would thoroughly recommend you all take the time to take a look at that. Um, and let us know how you get on. And, and hopefully you'll all be migrating away from legacy systems successfully in the coming months. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your crazy day today. And uh, we appreciate that, that you are here. And for AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you with our next webcast. And have a great afternoon.